Lance, thanks for joining in and starting us off. So greetings to you as well. So if you're just joining in, we're saying hi to people we know, we're saying hi to people we don't know, we're forming some community, even though we are remote and this is a strange way to do it, we can still do it. Say hi to someone you know, say hi to someone you don't know, and we'll get started in just a minute or two. Okay, we are going to give you the opportunity to continue to form community as we get started. And we want to welcome you now to today's session on advancing equity through momentum. And this is during the Complete College America virtual event with equity and justice for all. My name is Brandon Protus. I'm a strategy director here at CCA. Please note that all attendees have been muted. We encourage you to view this session through speaker view so you can see who's talking. We've purposely set this up as a meeting and not as a webinar for some interaction that we'll have later. Also, please note that all sessions are being recorded and will be accessible in the virtual attendee hub until December, 2020. We're thrilled to have all of you from across the country and beyond joining us today. So please engage in the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag equity and justice for all. That's all a single word spelled out. So again, on Twitter, the hashtag equity and justice for all. Now we hope that you've had a chance to watch today's videos on demand. Our Alliance highlight was momentum or is momentum in Massachusetts, which is supported by our partnership with the Bar Foundation. We also have tools for change session two, how change happens, stories, trust and data-driven processes, which is supported by the ECMC Foundation. If you haven't seen them yet, they are available to watch at your convenience because they are videos on demand. So be sure to check them out. Now, you've heard CCA talk about momentum year and momentum metrics in the past. We are now taking a deeper approach. So momentum is designing multiple avenues for students to get started, earn credits faster, and stay on track to graduate. So just as we think about momentum, the concept is getting speed started from the beginning, maintaining that speed, and then increasing that speed. So simply put, what we're going to talk about today with momentum is more students, more credits, faster, with a focus on completion and equity. Just a quick session overview. I'm going to give a brief presentation. After that, we're going to have a panel conversation with Beth, Dr. Beth Doyle, the Vice President for the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, and Dr. Chris Mullen, the director from Strong Start to finish. We're gonna leave about 10 minutes towards the end of that for questions and answers through you. And then we will conclude the formal presentation and then open up for a half an hour for office hours. So we encourage you to send chats, uh, questions in the chat box uh, towards the end of those 10 minutes of the formal presentation. We will take a look at those. We'll also allow you to unmute yourselves if you wanna ask a live question. And then we'll encourage you to stay tuned for office hours with the opportunity to connect with the panelists in a smaller room to ask specific questions. So let's get started. On Monday, CCA unveiled its new framework for strategies and pillars. If you were unable to join us, we're going to drop a link in the chat with a video that provides more context and discusses these four pillars. The CCA theory of change is built around how we can accelerate policy, create conditions for change, and implement strategies for reform. So you'll see that momentum is part of an integrated and comprehensive set of pillars and strategies. Yesterday, we spoke about purpose, today, momentum. Tomorrow, we're gonna to focus on structure and on Friday, support. This new framework of expanded pillars and strategies, this is an evolution for equitable outcomes for students. And the theme for this week is equity and justice. And when we put this lens on momentum, we have to name it. The problem still exists. We know that black and brown and low income students are not starting off with the momentum they need because too often they're placed in long series of remedial courses 
at much higher rates than other students with poor outcomes as they are completing their college level English and math courses or their credentials at much lower rates. This is not equity. So similarly, we can look at how colleges are structured and how we train advisors and others around the college around credit accumulation to ensure that students are completing on time. Again, we know black, brown, low-income students are disproportionately impacted. Again, this is not equity. That's why Complete College America, we talk about institutional performance gaps. And I have to give a nod to Dr. Estella Ben-Simone, who is a CCA board member, who really coined this phrase. And we use it because institutional performance gaps puts the responsibility and the accountability on the institutions rather than the onus on students. So rather than blaming students, the good news is that institutions, if done right, can make the changes needed. So a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Andrew Perry of the Brookings Institute was interviewed on NPR's Planet Money about his new book, Know Your Price. And in that he defines and talks about what he calls devalued assets. He was able to definitively show that homes and businesses in black communities were worth less, even when controlling for all other factors. So the reason that they are devalued, their assets, is purely because of the communities in which they're situated. So how does this apply to higher education? Well, I submit that we can use momentum to value and revalue the assets across communities, Latinx communities, Black communities, Indigenous, low-income, adult learner communities. You see, historically and too often today, colleges have been based off of a model of the student who's graduating from high school, going directly to a four-year college or university, that student is white, middle or upper middle class, that college is a residential institution. But that's not the current state or the live reality for many of our students who instead find themselves on a treadmill of bureaucracy, of hurdles, processes, and eventually they either get thrown off or they just get off this treadmill because they're not getting anywhere. They're not making it through the remedial class sequences to that college level class, or they're not earning the credits that are relevant to their degrees. So if we truly value what our black and our brown and our low income students are bringing with them, it's up to us that to erase those institutional performance gaps and create momentum and avenues for momentum for them. So Dr. A Anthony Carnavali the, from the Georgetown Center on Education and the Workforce in his most recent book, The Merit Myth, he poses the question, is the purpose of higher education to educate a citizenry and a workforce that's needed across the whole country? Because that ties into our theme, equity and justice for all, focusing on the all. And what would it look like our, if our institutions were organized around that? And he compares that or contrasts it to, is the purpose of higher education to distinguish and reward individuals who are already achieving at the highest. So this is education for some, because it's based off competition where those who are already advantaged continue to get ahead and those who are disadvantaged continue to get left behind. You see, higher education can be used um, to screen and reveal talent that already exists. Or what I hope is that higher education can be used to cultivate and to create talent. Let me say that again, to cultivate and to create that talent. And if so, momentum can disrupt a system that right now sorts students in ways that reinforces the divisions across income and race as an instrument of social stratification. If done right, we can use education as an equalizer. So let's talk about the strategies. Again, more students, more credits, faster, with a focus on completion and equity in mind. And now more than ever with COVID and the economic turndown it is so important to meet students' needs because we know our black, our brown, our low-income students right now are not returning. They're enrolling at lower rates because they're not sure if college is a place for them or they're torn with the need to work and family. And so we need to find ways to build that momentum. Again, designing multiple avenues for students to get started, earn credits faster and stay on track to graduate. Credit for competency. This recognizes the prior learning skills and knowledge that students possess and establishes mechanisms to award appropriate credits. So the students who are already coming in with those skills, that exists already, but institutions can make that change to develop that momentum from the beginning by finding ways how that aligns to credits when appropriate. Multiple measures. How we consider a variety of placement options that include high school grade point average to provide more ways for students to take a college level class in their first semester. This means finding more ways into college level classes rather than more barriers to keep students out so we can get that momentum started. Co-requisite support, 
designing structures and pedagogical approaches for students needing or requesting additional support to succeed in that college level English or math foundational class. So they complete the requirements in a single academic term. So simply put, you're taking a college level English or math course immediately, not those long sequences of remedial courses, and you're paired with a support course, building that momentum. Concurrent enrollment, provide high school students opportunities to earn college credits while they're still in high school so they can get an early start on college. So before that they thought that they might be a college student, they actually are because they're starting it early, building that early momentum. And what we know is that propels them forward to build that college identity so they continue even further. 15 to finish and stay on track. How we invest in coordinating communications efforts and structural solutions to match student credit loads with the credits they need for on-track graduation. This is often misunderstood because this is both for part-time and full-time students to ensure if you want to graduate in two years or in three years that, that you're taking the credits necessary to do that rather than being on a six-year track. Now, CCA has designed these pillars really around the student experience. And so if we transform with that in mind, what does it look like when a student first interacts with the college? Are they faced with a lot of hoops to jump through and a really well-intentioned one-pager about the 10 steps to enrollment that never talks about the 10 steps to completion and really just focus on bureaucracy and college processes, but not on the student themselves? Or could we design a welcoming process with lots of ways to propel them to start fast and propel them forward? So what you're already coming with experience, let's evaluate to see if this aligns with your program of study and if there's a way we can award credit for that. Or co-requisite support, you're looking for additional support. We can do that and put you in the college class right from the beginning. Concurrent enrollment, you might not have seen yourself as a college student, but we've aligned the high school and college curriculum and we know where it matches up and you can take that college course while you're in high school, propel you forward. This is about how students can show and build upon their potential and how institutions organize around this. Again, if we are to cultivate and create that talent, we're building it off of the potential of the students, what we know they have with them. Now that transformation from an institutional perspective might look a little different because we know that one strategy impacts another strategy. We really have to think about is the educational architecture of our colleges and our universities. The strategies are interconnected with each other and they're integrated in this comprehensive approach. In fact, just today, MDRC released a policy paper um, or a report on developmental education. It speaks to this as it connects multi multiple strategies. So let's think about co-requisite support. If we wanna start implementing co-requisite support, since taking a support class with a college class from the beginning. Once we start doing that, we're going to have to look at multiple measures for how students place into which course. And once we do that, then we have to think about, well, what's the appropriate math course for their program of study? So now we're going to be looking at math pathways. Well, once we start talking about math pathways, we need to make sure we're talking across some of the other pillars at academic maths so that we know that they have courses that are aligned to their degree, not only at your own institution, but so that they transfer easily. And if we're doing that, looking across another pillar, proactive advising for how we're interfacing with students. Again, this is an integrated approach. And the good thing is when we do a systems thinking, we are transforming the entire college. We're no longer siloed. This isn't student services or the academic side of the house. This is everybody working together. And we can't be siloed because we have to talk across all lines, across all departments, for full transformation. And why are we doing this? Because we have equity in mind. And what it really comes to is who are we centering? Are we centering equity and completion and scale? And what I mean by that is with scale, you might have the best program with amazing results for those 200 students who were fortunate enough to be part of it. But that doesn't work for everyone. So if we wanna scale, we're not looking just at pilot programs, we're looking at how we transform the college experience for all students. Thinking about completion, we want to make sure that students are earning that credential of value. And with equity, as I talked about before, how colleges have historically been organized, we need to reorient that. Think about what our colleges would look like if we centered our colleges and how we provide our services and teach our classes for a 38-year-old Latina single mom who's been working for 15 years, doing accounting for a small business, doesn't have the educational background, as carrying both kids and ailing adults. What would our colleges look like for that 16 year old black high school male student who excels in math, but whose parents didn't go to college? This student has aspirational capital and is still building some of the navigational and social capital around college. How would we build our colleges for that student? Or a 23 year old indigenous student who graduated from high school with a 3.2 GPA, 
took some time off for high school and was trying to figure out what those next steps are. Fortunately, Complete College America has done a lot of work in these areas. So I wanna talk briefly about lessons we've learned through an analysis we did in more than a dozen states who've been working with us to scale code requisite support. And these lessons learned actually go across the strategies. They need to be linked to equity goals. We talked to someone who said CoREC was going great, but they didn't realize explicitly that it's an equity strategy and they might've viewed it differently. We need to name it and we need to make it explicit and not make those assumptions. And we need to show the data for why that is, which is why we disaggregate the data. Now, just disaggregating the data alone isn't enough. While that certainly can show who is benefiting and who's not, and which students we need to look at in different ways through our institutional lens, it's how we turn that into action that matters. And when I talk about policy and practice, this means that you need both structures and pedagogy. So policy can set up the structures, but if you set up co-requisite and you have an instructor who says, turn to your left and turn to your right, one or both of those students aren't gonna make it through this class. You are not going to achieve the same results as if you have an instructor who's using active learning strategies, culturally competent teaching, understanding just-in-time teaching methodology that fits for a co-requisite support. It takes both the structure and the pedagogy. At CCA, we like both a grass tops and a grassroots approach, where a grass tops sets a vision, but you still need that grassroots. You need faculty and staff, not just to be consulted, but deeply involved. They need to drive these processes so this change is real and deep, both with breadth and with depth. It's not a one and done proposition. In CoREC, there's some things that you can do all at once and some things that are iterative. Once you are able to implement one piece, you can move on to the next piece. Plus there's local context and there's ways that you need to find out what's working and how you need to improve. And you cannot over communicate. As we talked about, if this is across all different parts of the college, you need to give both the same and targeted messages to the faculty and staff in those subject areas. The faculty in other subject areas because it's gonna impact them as well to our admissions and our registrars for the role that they play, for our advisors, to our high schools and our students and our families, how we relay this information on our website. It needs to be relayed over and over. And also because a lot of pieces of co-requisite and some of these other strategies may seem subtle, they're paradigm shifts. I know my former institution, when we were moving to some of these reforms, it took me a while, maybe four or four, five times before I fully understood how profound they were. So it's important to continue communicate to communicate and communicate. And with that, I want you all to go to your browser because I know you're in front of the computer and type in completecollege.org. You'll go to our website. And I'm asking you to do that because I want you to create a profile because when we talk about communication, this is how you can stay up to date with resources, the latest information and connect with colleagues um, across our entire network. So again, it's completecollege.org. Please create a profile today. So I told you I was gonna be doing a short presentation and then shifting to a panel. So in just a second, I'm gonna introduce our two panelists and they're gonna talk briefly about themselves and their organizations, how it relates to the strategies. At that point, I will turn off the PowerPoint so we can engage in some deep conversation. So first up, we have Dr. Beth Doyle. She's the vice president at the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. We invite her, her here for lots of reasons. One of those is uh, Kale just recently released with Witchy a great report called the PLA Boost. Beth, can you take it away? Yes, thank you, Brendan, for having me today um, and to Complete College America for this great session. Um, I, I just wanted to take a moment to give you a little background on Kale. For those of you who don't know us, it stands for the Council for Adult and Experiential Le Learning. We call ourselves Kale, like the vegetable. Um, we're, we're good for you. Um, we champion adult learners. That's really our mission. So you're going to hear a lot of that from me in this panel, uh, the lens of the adult learner, the adult student and their perspective. Um, we're also committed to integrating learning and work. In other words, we're thinking about the pathway to college, through college um, and beyond into uh, a meaningful career. And so as part of that, we connect educators, employers and regions. We started out as um, a research project and then became an organization of institutions that were committed to prior learning assessment. 
Um, so you're going to hear that that credit for prior learning lens when I talk about credit for competency, but it has put us into uh, introduced us into the realms of credit for competency and lots of other ways as well. Um, but that is our history. And over the decades, we kind of went from being focused on just working with higher ed institutions that wanted to better serve adult learners and actually starting to work directly with employers where the adult learners were um, in order to engage them with education and also with workforce organizations um, who are very key right now as they're dealing with large numbers of um, unemployed folks uh, who need education. This is just a slide and I'm not gonna dig in here too deeply, but just to explain a little bit about Kale's philosophy and approach when we do consulting projects and technical assistance work, we think about it through this sort of frame. Um, it's inspired a little bit by, um, by Hyatt's book, ADCAR, you know, sort of change management uh, theories and also some systems thinking as well. But what we're trying to do here is first sort of gather data so people can see where they are, assess themselves as an institution. We're not talking about students, we're talking about institutions and systems and workforce organizations. Start working with those partners to co-create strategies and goals so that uh, we, we like to bring people together to co-create. It's a way of building uh, momentum and awareness um, and, uh, and consensus, and then really documenting those action plans and measures that you're going to do to make sure that you're measuring whether you're successful and building capacity then more broadly within the institution so you can start to scale these things and continuously improve them. So um, I just wanted you to understand sort of our philosophy of how we work with institutions, because you might hear that come out in some of my comments during our panel discussion as well. Um, it's really about that awareness, that desire, building the ability to solve problems, and then actually reinforcing that behavior um, so that you really create uh, change within your organization in a permanent way, uh, even as Brendan was talking about with communication and some of those other things. Um, so that is what I wanted to cover before we jump into the panel. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you. We'll now let Dr. Chris Mullen, he's the director at Strong Start to Finish, introduce himself. We want to make sure that attendees can learn more about the Strong Start to Finish core principles and the process for getting state support from Strong Start. Whether that comes out now or in the office hours, that'd be a great thing to talk to Chris about. Go ahead, Chris. Brent, thank you. Thank you, Complete College of America, and thank all of you for finding time today to, on your busy schedules to come together to talk about this issue of momentum. We all know there's a persistent problem among colleges and universities for students placed in developmental courses like math and English. They are not completing the courses and in most cases should not be taking them in the first place. And while developmental education outcomes are deeply troubling for state leaders who are worried about educational attainment goals, for institutional leaders who are concerned about their graduation and retention rates, and for practitioners who are concerned about the success of their courses, for low-income students, students of color and returning adults who see college as a path to something greater, our collective failure to adequately support their success is a heavy burden to bear. This is why we exist. Strong Start to Finish is a network of like-minded individuals and organizations from the policy, research, and practice spaces who've come together for one reason, to help all students, not just the select few, find success in post-secondary education. We connect higher education systems and institutions with proven tools, quality technical assistance, and financial and human capital resources, to give every student the best start on their path toward a degree. Our work is centered in three areas. We engage currently 13 systems of higher education whose actions and evidence-based policies are working, succeeding in their goal of giving college students a strong start toward their degree. We work with these systems to deepen our knowledge of how they are achieving these results, and more importantly, how these best practices can be scaled up across institutions of all sizes and locations. And we work with funders and partners to grow this network of knowledge so that actionable evidence-based policies and practices can be applied and executed on a broad scale. The resulting network of higher education leaders, policy entrepreneurs, institutions, and technical assistance providers illustrated on the slide before you is driving toward an outcome where all students pass their first credit-bearing English and math course during their first year of study. 
To do this, we are identifying and scaling policies and practices to fit institutions, large and small, so that all college students start and finish strong. We are developing next generation technical assistance practices and policies to help more students succeed. When I say we, it's by large part due to the partners on this screen. Um, from the Ada Center to Complete Culture America to the Association for Institutional Research and funders like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Ascendium, and Kresge. We are supporting and undertaking research as well and evaluation efforts to advance our collective understanding of what works for which type of students under what conditions. We are very impatient and dedicated. We know that by working together, we are creating a ripple effect and leveraging momentum that will ultimately increase success for all students and give them a strong start to a meaningful post-secondary credential. So thank you for time to provide a quick overview of Strong Start to Finish. I will say uh, I have the honor of leading Strong Start. It's been here almost three years. Uh, my, my background and positioning is uh, I'm obviously a, a white male who comes to this world with, position, with power uh, and given to me, not necessarily earned by others. And I recognize it, working very hard to elevate the voices of others uh, throughout my career. Uh, I've been a teacher uh, uh, for universities of record, uh, an early childhood, elementary, middle, and high school as well, high school special ed in math, and, um, and worked in three system offices in Illinois, the university system in, in, in Florida, and the college system in Florida. So I enter this work through the lens of a, of a researcher and a practitioner who's led state systems. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Brandon, and look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, um, both Beth and Chris. We're going to engage in some conversation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and I encourage the attendees to, if you haven't already, to switch to speaker view. And the reason for that is so that you are able to see who is speaking. Um, so let me just start off with an open question. Like the participants in CCA week, You've recently been introduced to the new framework of the CCA pillars and strategies. In fact, we purposely didn't show them to you until the last week or so. So I'm just curious, what are your initial thoughts overall and what strengths do you see in grouping these multiple strategies together under the momentum pillar? So I'm happy to jump in first. Um, we, you know, I'm gonna have my adult student lens, right? So we know that adult students and part-time students lag in graduation rates, pretty seriously lag in their graduation rates. Um, and for those students, time is really the barrier, the, the family obligations, the work obligations, the life obligations that pull them in different directions uh, is the factor. So momentum is important because the more time they have to spend um, in college, the more it pulls them away from their other obligations. It also is an important issue because it pulls them away from career opportunities. If it takes you a, uh, a decade to get a degree, then that is a decade you've lost in building your career in, that, in, that, in your, in your cho chosen field. Um, so, you know, I think that this also is interesting because even though I'm saying adult students, this impacts younger students too, because especially when you're talking about low income, first generation students of color, they often have to work. They often have to take care of other family members, um, whether it's dependents or older family members, especially now in this time. And so those, those competing demands become, um, major weak cannot make them slog through years and years of school. We just cannot. And so credit for competency is the, is the area that of course resonates very much with me. Um, I experienced it as a student, um, earning some credit for uh, my work experience, um, having received transfer credit that allowed me to get my uh, bachelor's degree, which more quickly, which then allowed me to get my doctorate uh, one day. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had time for that. So it's a, a very personal thing for, for me from that perspective as well. And uh, there's also this whole getting stuck in remedial coursework that I hear a lot about. I think um, what's really interesting, though, is this talk about co-requisite support because it, you know when I was doing my dissertation I talked to a lot of adjunct faculty um, and there were concerns about 
you know, are we just trying to get rid of remedial education and then the students are not learning that? Well, no, it's important that they continue to learn those things, but can we make this happen faster? Can we stop them from getting stuck? I think is really important and can help us get to greater equity in those graduation rates. Beth, if it's so, okay, can I jump in real quick? Because sure. you made a point that um, yeah. I think it's really important for the attendees to know, which is um, Complete College America really sees the issue as the system, right? It's a long sequences of remedial education. And that's different than what developmental education is where you're taking the best of developmental psychology when it got started by our friends at NAE, now NAS or the NCDE, right? It is taking the best of developmental psychology and applying that to adult learning. And we know some of our best instructors understand that to get to that point. So we're not attacking developmental educators. It's more the system where students are not getting through. And we know that from a data perspective. So I wanna make sure that people understood that perspective from Complete College America, because that may be new for some people. Yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you. You know, and part of when, when you, know, you know, you asked the question about momentum and how did we feel when we saw it and you would written, just got introduced to it last week and I I thought you know this fits with where we are as a society you know we our children and Beth you mentioned adults and, and young people alike it's like we don't spend two hours cooking dinner at night anymore we microwave our food or order DoorDash we don't sit like society doesn't operate at a pace where we can sit on the quad like we did in the 1980s and pontificate what our major might be and think about where we might want to head we, we live in a rapid decision environment right and it's a norm that our students are used to. It might not be a norm that we as institutions of higher ed are used to, right? We, we spend long amounts of time writing papers and thinking and contemplating deeply. But the customers, the, 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 the students that we serve, the communities and the world that they live in before they cross our doors are a rapid pace environment, right? And so when this idea of Monday came up, the first thing that came to my mind is I had a flashback and went to Cliff Edelman's The Toolbox Revisited report and, and, and answers in a toolbox about where this idea of academic momentum really picked up. Uh, Tinto did some work beforehand. And then he said, what a big takeaway from that work was that the student uses of time in undergraduate careers are now more important than their uses of place. So we moved from a, a going to a place to experiencing things in real time. And Momentum's excited about, exciting about that. You know, he, he touched upon a lot of things in that report. I outlined some of the things that really showed where it's really important to take additive credits. You know, he said like six, 12 credit hours if a student can have it before they get to college is a great accelerant for momentum. He said things like, uh, you know, continuous enrollment increases the probability of a degree by 43%. Data and things that still inform our thinking, where Cliff was off a little bit to your point, Brandon, was, you know, a lot of the things he said were, is all placed on the student to make the right decisions, right? So in that report, and, and Cliff is a wonderful person, and God rest his soul, he, you know, he said things like, students have to meet the challenge of college level math, and they have to in the effort to increase their GPA rather than looking at what are we, and that's true, students have to put the work in, but to your point, what are we as institutions, what are we as systems putting in the way of students being able to do that? I appreciate your focus on those institutional performance gaps and also bringing it to the current reality, right? So we're in the middle of these dual pandemic COVID and um, it's not a racial awakening because these issues ha are, have been happening for a very long time, but maybe um, we're starting to hear them and address them in new ways. And one of the things I hear is, great, if we want to be anti-racist, we believe in that, but how does that translate into concrete actions? And I think education is a place for this. So I'm curious when we think of some of the specific strategies within Momentum, how do these relate to equity and justice for all? I mean, that's a really big ask, equity and justice for all. I truly believe that these strategies fit with that. I'm just curious where you see those connections. Sure. For me, we see it in multiple measures, testing directly, right? A study just came out by the Center for Analysis of Post-Secondary Readiness. I encourage everybody to look at it and I'll put it in the chat here in a second. You know, we're seeing all gender, Pell recipient status and race ethnicity subpopulations, you know, had higher rates of placement in the college level courses using just the standard single test. And we know that a single test doesn't work. And so it has positive equity impacts. That being said, you know, the white program group students experienced a slightly larger game in terms of placement compared to other groups, but that's comparing one group against the other, right? When we look at the real gains for, when they look at the gains for black students went from 29 to 34%, for Hispanic from 42 to 45% were placed into more college level courses. And so what we're seeing is we're getting more students into these courses and when they're placed in the right courses, they're being much more successful in the work that they do. Uh, but in no case is a single high-stakes standardized test as a tool for placement 
uh, the right thing for students, especially for the populations we care about. What I like is yeah. that takes it away from the student. It's not, is the student good enough or not? It's how are we looking at what that student brings to make that determination, which may be arbitrary and may not even be accurate to unlock that potential of the student. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I was just gonna, you know, bring up the point that um, of course we know there's a completion problem among minority groups. There's also a completion problem among part-time students. And when we dug in, we've been doing a, a, a project called the Latino Adult Student Success uh, Initiative. When we started to dig in with some institutions, we found that there was a lot of overlap also between those groups, right? So we're talking about part-time adult learners plus um, plus, you know, they were also Latinos uh, as well. And so we're seeing this kind of um, overlap of, of, uh, of things going on. And I think what has happened now in, in terms of awakening is just that we need to dig a little bit deeper um, to figure, to, to really see the flaws here. There's a tendency to pretend it, the point that you made that we're in a meritocracy um, and that these students just kind of lack grit um, or something. I, I think that we need to really think about, um, and we tend to think, well, higher education is the least biased um, obstacle, but are we? I mean, I think we need to give ourselves a really hard look um, and it can be damaging to students to sort of say, oh no, we're doing everything right. You're, you're the one who has the problem. And it's a bit dishonest because we know, frankly, higher ed was originally built for the elite. It was built to create an elite. Um, and that has started changing, particularly since the GI Bill, right? We begin to think more about access um, and over you know, the last few decades, but we're still kind of babies in a way in terms of really thinking about what equity means. It's not just about access, right? It has to be about success. And so what are all the things that are sort of layered in there that are sending the message that, oh, if you can't be going full time, and this is where I think momentum can, we have to be cautious with momentum. Yeah, you can't no, I, go full time. So then therefore you're not part of this system, you know? Yeah, we, we, we know credit accumulation is really, really important. I agree with you on that one. And, and Larry Abel put a note in here about what can kill momentum is the loss of, of credits. It's kind of picking up on what you're saying there, Beth. And I think, you know, what's really important too is what is success? So when we looked at the data we, from an equity lens, you know, much larger percentage of black and brown kids were getting D's and their and their gateway math courses, which is great because from the policy perspective, the institutions and, and systems have, they passed the course because they didn't fail. The problem is those credits don't transfer. And so that's a momentum killer. So having policies and be really explicit about what it means to pass the course is really important. We're seeing a lot of our partners conduct research and look at studies and saying that passing is a, is a C or higher, and that can make a difference from equity impacts. So that way when they move, the credit doesn't get lost you know, Larry, and so that's a really important part. I just saw in the chat, wanted to bring bring forward about something that we need to, to look at and have a conversation. I mean, we have extremely talented and dedicated faculty across the country who wake up every day, go to work and put their best foot forward. We have partner organizations and institutions that are working really hard with faculty around this work. And so, you know, a lot of what we're talking about is structures, but it's also that the faculty there and those organizations are, are working real hard on faculty quality. I think our conversation is really on this, this policy and structural part as well. Chris, actually, I'd like to talk about that for a second. And I received a private message since we've been talking. So I want to talk about quality, but let me just cue this up. Complete College America, we have a very strong partnership with Strong Start to Finish. We're active in many states because of this partnership. And so sometimes you could get the question, oh, is it really quality? What do you mean you're giving credit just because someone did work? Is that really quality or co-rec? Is that really quality? Or how do you ensure the quality of not just the co-rec course, but the primary course as well? So I know when we go into states, we work with content experts who are faculty from around the country who are at the top of their game in organizations like ACU, the Association of College and University Educators, who talk what you just talked about, specifically about that quality, ensuring it, so it's not a pass-through. And one other example I'll give, um, I have a lot of experience with concurrent enrollment. Um, before joining CCA, I was a board member on the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships. 
And I bring this up because about two or three weeks ago, there was an article that came out that was somewhat critical of the quality of concurrent enrollment. And I read it and I said, sure, if you have a fly-by-night poor quality program, that's what you're going to get, which is why NASEP has quality standards that they accredit to, to ensure that high quality where it's the same college class, whether it's taught the high school or the college. So let me just ask that question larger, because I think that is a fair question of, where does quality fit in? So we're ensuring high levels of rigor and high levels of standards. And this isn't just, well, we're gonna push them through to get the momentum, but ensure quality for students. Sure, so, so I'll turn to Beth, but if I, if I could just answer two things quickly, Beth, and I'll turn to you is, one is, and on the call, I saw her name, Alexa Logue, her, she and her colleagues uh, did a study recently about uh, co-requisite work in the CUNY system with, um, uh, uh, Marie Wakana Bay Rose uh, and Douglas, and they show that the long-term outcomes of students are doing just as well. Uh, the, the name of the, you know, one of the early challenges came from folks who said, yeah, it would be great, you get them to co-rec, but then they fail at high levels. And that we're just seeing not just co-rec because dev ed and gateway course completion, but those gains carry through. So there's quantitative evidence that those students are successful in later courses and, and more likely to complete a degree. And again, Lexa, I think you're here. Uh, if you wanna chime in in a chat and provide more details, you're the expert, that's, that's fine. Uh, the second part I'd say is, you know, we're, we've learned a lot, uh, and those, especially in the co-rec space, the, the uh, partners like the, you know, the Dana Center, your targeting math pathways, all, everybody's been involved in this co-rec movement, CCA for a long time, have learned things that make things, make the course work, and when the, there's principles that come to play, so when, when students are aligned, uh, the, the co-rec course and the McGaway course are aligned on content, that's really important, right? And so we're just reinforcing what you're learning, not, not lowering the bar to some other standard that's lower. Um, and so there's embedded in side-by-side -side support just to help people re-understand re the content. And this is especially true as I turn it to Beth for adult learners who might've not taken a math class in a few years. These correct support classes just help them re remember what the quadratic formula was or, or just like row, that song that row, row, row your boat or however, you know, so there's, there's these things that can just help people and provide that little extra support they need to be successful because they have the capability of doing so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with that. I would say also, you know, and I noticed a couple of questions in the chat about the transferability of credit for prior learning. That is a huge problem. Um, I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, we definitely need to improve that transferability and that connects to the quality question, right? And it, the argument is that it isn't, it isn't of a high enough quality. So a couple of things that I would say there. Um, one, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm never exactly sure. Like, so if you follow the, 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 the true principles of assessing learning um, and you're looking at somebody who wrote a paper, which is essentially equivalent to a final paper of a course or who, who uh, took a test that was essentially equivalent to the final test um, in that course, I'm not under, I'm not quite understanding, you know, uh, where the quality barrier is. I think, yeah, if people are not following those standards, that is a problem. But we also know that there are, you know, individual professors who might in a course pass someone and not follow standards, right? I, it, it seems a little confusing to me as to why those things are different. Quality control is important in both, whether it's prior learning assessment or assessment of success in any course, right? Whether that person is sitting in a seat or they're online or any of those things, we do need to understand that the student has grasped the competencies they need to grasp. And that's the most important thing. I think the other thing is if you, uh, I know uh, we was mentioned earlier that Kale just came out with a study called the PLA Boost. Um, what that found is that students uh, with PLA had a credential completion rate of 49%, those without PLA 27%. Um, so both of those could be higher, to be honest, but we can see that there is an impact there. Now, if PLA was harming their ability to move on to the next course, then it wouldn't improve their completion rate, right? So obviously, if done right, in most cases, it's being done sufficiently uh, with enough rigor that those students are able to move on and continue to complete their credential and graduate. Um, and they actually end up taking, students who do PLA actually end up taking more course credits uh, than students who do not, because so many of those students drop out, um, that the ones that are retained actually end up taking more courses and succeeding in those courses and getting to graduation. So those are 
um, some indicators that really there is uh, the, the quality issue is maybe a little bit more of a mirage. Um, it's something we have to keep an eye on for sure, uh, but we don't want to use that as an excuse uh, to sort of deny students the progress that they need, the momentum that they need. Yeah. And Christopher, th uh, Christopher, Chris, thank you for uh, pointing out Lexa's work and that she's on this uh, webinar. She is a phenomenal researcher, and so she's released a series of very well-researched articles. I do encourage people to, to focus on those. Um, I want to read just a, another private comment that was sent to me, and then I want to ask one more question of both of you before we had opened up to questions for everyone. And so someone said to me, I think the momentum measures are solid, but measures alone won't lead to greater equity and outcomes unless we as practitioners approach our work in these measures with an equity lens. And so I think that's a really good point. I think this fits with that quality as well, because when I'm saying quality, that's quality of instruction, but that quality of pedagogy includes that lens of who are we serving and what is our approach, right, and to how we do this. So I guess the question I want to ask both of you is, CCA has created this more comprehensive integrated approach. So while there may be some discrete strategies, they're interconnected. Multiple measures connects to CoREC, connects to the others. What opportunities do you see for institutions, systems, state, even individuals, whether you're an instructor, your faculty, your staff, what are the opportunities to build momentum? And people see this and go, it's making sense. It's connecting. We finally connected the dots in a more in a deeper way, a more comprehensive way, what are the opportunities you see? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. It's, uh, go you know, so I think all this work is additive. What's really important is it's not like, and it's part inherent in the statement you said, Brandon, like this isn't a piecemeal reform effort. This isn't like, if I just do 15 to finish, the world's gonna be fine. Or if I just do multiple measures, it's all gonna work out. And I think it's inherent in the question itself. You know, there's a study about early momentum metrics that, that uh, Teachers College put together. It shows the additive nature of all these reforms together. The hard part is like, where do you begin and where do you start? And you start where it's important for you. So in the 13 systems of higher ed we're working with, it's a 368 institutions, I believe, 92 universities. Each of them pick the spot where they know they need to work. Like, you know where you need to start. You need to start with the uh, uh, peer advising, with the purpose force part. You need to start with just your data and getting the, the, the numbers right and finally, finally disaggregating it and building a data system so you can really look and understand the context and the people that you really care about. Uh, you need to really focus on the, the equity part. So the way you elevate equity too is, let's have the decency and honor to really understand the student experience, right? And that's something we try really hard to do uh, strong start to finish. Like we have things called people in reform, one from Kim Hunter Reed yesterday talking about their lived experience, implementing these reforms and what it means to them. And that's how we refine and how we get better. Uh, so we might, because sometimes we might implement something that, that doesn't work perfectly. We know Corex, you go from about 12% pass rate to about a 60% pass rate in your class. That's amazing. There's still 40% who aren't passing to this quality part beforehand, but it happens and it happens because faculty are working really hard together. Um, and so there's, there's different component parts of it, but this, all these things are additive together. You've got to pick the couple that work for you and start on them. Uh, Beth, you wanna... Yeah, yeah, no, I agree completely. And in fact, um, you know, uh, when I was talking earlier with the slides about the framework of, you know, trying to f decide on the action items that are really going to work for you. And, you know, we've, there's been a, a passing mention of systems thinking, really looking at like, what is the, what is the leverage point, you know, it's sort of how can you assess where you are, what are the, the areas that you need to work on? And then find what the real leverage point is and center your action plans around that. Um, the, this sounds uh, simplistic, but it really is not. You know, sometimes you'll find, we find oftentimes, for instance, one of the negative things in our PLA study is that, um, is that only 11% of adult students, one in 10, have ever done any PLA, right? That's the, oftentimes, that's a communication problem. Um, that's a flow. It's because all the, the systems are not connected together. I think to the point, if the institution is focused on momentum and all of these pieces of what makes momentum work, it has to bleed out into the entire institution. It can't sit in one office. It can't sit with one particular only academics 
academics is important. Faculty have to be part of that, right? But also it has to be part of advising. It has to be part of even admissions, enrollment. It has to be part of the whole system. So I think you really need to think about what are the, the wins that you can have that will actually change the entire system and the entire experience um, for the student, really looking at that student journey through all of these pieces and understanding it um, in a deeper way and the impact that you're having in all those pieces along the way. Thank you, Beth. We have about 10 minutes before we break for our office hours. So I wanna to get to some questions from our attendees. Uh, one for each of you, and these should be quick because they're pretty um, discreet. So one from Jeremy Lawrence. Um, he said he was at a recent presentation where PLA included AP credit students. And so he wants to know if that's the case with your numbers, um, is AP part of PLA? Oh, advanced placement for prior learning assessment. So I'm not talking alphabet soup. Yes, um, yes, we do consider AP um, part of, uh, of prior learning assessment. However, we are typically doing, um, we are typically breaking out adult students. So we're talking about people over the age of 25. So in that case, then when you're breaking out adult learners, you know, we're, their AP is included in that, but they may not have done AP in the traditional way that you're thinking about it. So they may have taken an advanced placement test, for instance, not necessarily had the whole high school experience with AP. One other quick question that was sent to me privately, but do you know any community colleges that are doing well with PLA that you could just do a shout out to for someone who says, I wanna look at how they're doing it? And if you don't know, I don't yeah. wanna put you on the spot. <laughs> and and well, Chris, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna have a similar question for you as well. So start thinking about it. I'm gonna go ahead and, and take a risk here and give a, give a shout out to a few institutions. Um, so I know uh, Pima Community College is doing a lot of work to really embed PLA into the way they think and train all their faculty. I noticed a, a chat that came up, you know, when we were talking about quality, it's important to have trained faculty in assessment um, and Pima is doing a great job uh, of doing that. Um, and really trying to scale it up. Uh, the other uh, community college um, is uh, Community College of Vermont is doing an amazing job of communicating PLA. So they are actually uh, talking to students about that upfront. And so they're really working on increasing their take up rates. Um, and I also wanna call out Ivy Tech Community College uh, for their crosswalks. They have built crosswalks from military training, uh, all sorts of uh, credentials uh, that are out there that are non-credit and crosswalk them into their four credit courses in a way that's really easy for students to understand exactly how their credit fits into their degree plan. So that's my shout out. It was also a <laughs> shout out that I received. Thank you, Michelle, um, that Tennessee has done a great job statewide with both four and yes, two years. So people are looking. That is true. So Chris, there was also a question for you. And by the way, Beth, I love that you referenced Pima Community College because I'm originally from Arizona and lived in Tucson for many years. <laughs> so you referenced one place I've lived and this next question references another place that I've lived. So Chris, there was a question um, asking uh, specifically about states or institutions um, doing great work around co-requisite math. And the person who asked it said, I know there's some great work coming out of Colorado. And so I will also say, there's been some great published work out of my former institution, the Community College of Denver. So it's kind of nice to see that book ended. Um, that was not intentional, but Chris, do you know of other um, states or institutions doing co-rec around math? I will say one more thing that CCA is currently doing a project in the entire state of Oregon that I'm leading around co-rec math. Maybe I'm stealing your thunder, but thoughts, Chris? No, uh, absolutely. And so, you know, we, we work really close with state systems that are working at scale with institutions within the state. So. Places that are looking at co-rec math include um, Ohio, you know, the, part, the partnership between Ohio Department of Ed and Ohio Association of Community Colleges. You have co-rec math happening, uh, of course, in Tennessee, you have it happening in Georgia, you have it happening in Arkansas, the whole state of Arkansas. Mike Reese was just on here. We have it happening in West Virginia, yes, Jeremy, absolutely, North Carolina. I mean, it, it's becoming more commonplace and what we're seeing is it's moving from one institution within a state to scale, right? It's happening, as you said, in Colorado, we're working with Colorado Department of Higher Education about actually advising to get more students into the co-rep courses because it's just not enough to build them, but we need people to actually enroll in them uh, in addition to multiple measures. You're seeing, in Cal of course, in California, oh, the things are happening there on a, on a large scale. Um, Oregon, as you mentioned, is working on it right now. They're actually developing the courses with the universities to make sure they're transferable too. So that's really great work happening in Oregon. 
We have work happening in Louisiana where every state has their own implementation plan. Just last week, I had a chance to meet with the Board of Governors and talk about the Great Board of Regents, pardon me, and the great work happening in the state of Louisiana. And so, you know, I can almost look at every state that I've been able to, to work with and all of them are working on this co-rec part of the puzzle. That it's one of the, as we talked about the first steps, it's one of the first steps that states are taking system-wide to make this work happen. Yep, I will also add someone throughout the California Acceleration Project. And so when we bring in technical assistance and content experts, we're actively working with them as well. So thank you, Kate, for adding that. Um, at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make another shift because we want to give a little bit of direction. Um, so let me share my screen. And thank you both Chris and Beth. You are not done yet, but this has really been an engaged conversation. I will say for our prep up to this, it's been nothing short of wonderful talking with both of you. Uh, so in closing of this formal piece, we'll talk about hours in the um, hopefully we've gone to a lot of the questions just through our conversation and then address them specifically. We were monitoring the chat, but please send remaining questions to info at completecollege.org and we'll follow up accordingly. Of course, remember, just go to completecollege.org to set up your profile so you can have access to resources and more through us. Registration is still open, so share this with your friends and colleagues. We know how much fun you've had here, starting off by building community and then hearing some great speakers. So join us later today at three o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific for better data, better decisions, talking about the post-secondary data partnership with our own Charles Ansel. Uh, tomorrow at noon Eastern, nine o'clock Pacific, building equity through structure with Dr. Dani Fu Elston. And on Friday, noon Eastern, nine o'clock Pacific, achieving equity with support. And of course, engage in the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag um, equity and justice for all, all a single word, all spelled out. So let me talk about how office hours is gonna work. And so trying to do the best we can to have some interaction, we found this to be actually very successful. In just a second, after I explain this, we're gonna to transition to office hours. And so this is like, at the end of a conference, you hear this amazing speaker and you go, I wanna to talk to that person more. And then you're standing around three others and you start talking. And it's hard sometimes to do that remotely. Well, we've created a way to do that through break. So the first breakout room, if you want to talk about concurrent enrollment, I can talk your ear off. Or if you want to talk about 15 to finish or stay on track, or you just want to talk to me about something else, you can join breakout room number one. If you say, Chris is a great guy, I want to talk to him. I also want to learn more about co-requisite support and multiple measures, breakout room number two. Um, breakout room number three, Dr. Beth Doyle, if you want to learn more about Kale and PLA Boost, credit for competency, you can go with her. And we're going to keep the main room open as a lobby area with Dr. Nia Heidel. She's our vice president at Complete College America. So make a note of those numbers because I'm going to tell you now how you're going to be able to do this. Um, if you have updated to the new Zoom, you should be able to go to the more button at the bottom of the screen and you should be able to select your own breakout room. If you don't have this option, just uh, rename yourself, find your picture, go to the three dots and rename yourself. Um, you can also go to the participants tab to do that and add the room number in front of your name. Our behind the scenes folks will then assign you because there's a lot of people on this webinar it might take a minute or two. And also if you wanna visit multiple rooms, you can certainly do that as well. Just bounce back to the main room and then either re uh, choose a new room or you can rename yourself to one of the new rooms and our behind the scenes folks will do that as well. So I'm gonna go back one slide so you can see the breakout rooms. And with that, I also wanna say thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, uh, Chris and Beth, you've done an amazing job. But CCA is about our network and our community and seeing so many people on this um, is just really heartening because we know that you care, that you're addressing these issues, that you've taken time to be with us. And so we're going to continue these conversations individually and in small groups. Again, keep the conversations going throughout the week and how we can advance this. I'm gonna go forward one more slide and we will see you in the breakout rooms.
Can you hear me now? Oh, hello? Hello? Yes, Anthony? Yeah. Yes, sorry, I've been okay. having trouble with my um, uh, computer. Is it possible that I can switch to another computer um, and still be allowed in the, um, the session in the breakout rooms? Yes. When you just log back in, you can just tell us what room you want to be in and we can move you. Okay, and can you remind me what the specific rooms are for um, individually again? Okay. We're going to put that in the chat. Do you see it? So room one is for concurrent enrollment with Charles and Brandon. Room two is going to be multiple measures and co-requisite support, which is with Chris Mullins. And then the room three is credit for competency, which is with Beth. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna copy that and save it and then I'll log into a different um, device. Yes, no problem at all. And if you have trouble, just put the message in the chat and we can move you right away. Thank you so much. No worries. Okay, everyone. So. Um, if you have, what I was saying a second ago is that if you have upload, updated your Zoom, if you have the most recent version, in the bottom you can click the breakout rooms and select the room that you're going, you want to be in. And in the chat, the everything is there. If you cannot do that, if you would click your, on your picture, there are three dots in the top right corner and rename yourself with a number that you want to be in or just put it there, it'll make it move a little bit faster um, than scrolling through the chat. But either way it would be, yes. Yeah. So that would be very good. Thank you. And we appreciate your patience. In the main room, Let's see. Hi, see my colleague Tamara. Hello. And so, hello. So, I don't know if anybody wanted to stay in this. Um, if everybody is looking to move or if someone wanted to stay in this room, let's see. 